ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه ومن تمسك بسنته ليوم الدين اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله تبارك وتعالى وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار we continue in the chapter of Kitab al-Nikah by the great illustrious Imam Al-Hafid Ahmed ibn Ali ibn Hajjah al-Asqalani Rahimahullah Rahmatu Wasi'ah Al-Mutawaffa Sanata Thamani Mi'ah Sanata Thamani Mi'ah Ithnaini wa Khamsi The illustrious great Imam with his tremendous treaties in fiqh which is in by the great illustrious scholar Ahmed ibn Ali ibn Hajjah al-Asqalani who died 852 after the hijrah of Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and we continue in this tremendous treatise clarifying the affairs of nikah in which <coughs> a lot of us have some needs to be enlightened in in regards to how to minister our, our affairs in marriage <coughs> In which you'll find that a lot of the problems in our community stem from this matter. As you'll find there's a tremendous khalal azim, there's a tremendous, <coughs> there's a tremendous khalal. You'll find that there's a tremendous type of, of discrepancy in the aspect of social ills or matters of families and knowing how to deal with one another. And like we talked about in the seminar, or the knowledge-based seminar that we established maybe approximately four months ago, we said that the problems just don't start within the marriage, it starts before. And then you have ignorance before the marriage. And what we mean by before the marriage is knowing how to pick a spouse and knowing what to say with the spouse and when sitting with the spouse, what to address and what questions to address. And also likewise, knowing when to be shy and knowing when it's not time to be shy. So everything can be clear. So once the marriage starts and inaugurates and you're actually in the marriage, Every be, everyone knows what their role is and know what to expect from one another so their duties and their rights can be fulfilled. Then within the marriage, how to deal with each other's shortcomings because ever, all of us are human beings and we come up short and knowing how to tolerate each other's shortcomings. And then if it doesn't work out, how to leave out the marriage in a, in a, in a way that is pleasing to Allah because a lot of marriages when people end it, it ends off in a manner that's very disrespectful where one is lashing out at one another and one is insulting one another and one is speaking down to his or her spouse or the spouse likewise or speaking in a very vile manner that goes against the kitab and sunnah. So all these matters, like we say, Ya Marshal Ikhwa, we need enlightenment. We need some enlightenment in regards to how to minister our affairs in, in marriage, like we said, before, in, and after. So this is the reason why we take the time out to learn these different ahadith and extract the fawait from them. So listen to the, what the Prophet wasallam had gave advice before the marriage. The example of that is this hadith. As we finish, the last one in the authority of Anas ibn Malik, that the Prophet wasallam had talked about and, and highly emphasized to the point, like we said, you'll find the majority of Ahl al-Ilm said, that marrying or getting married is wajib. The majority of Ahl Im saying that marriage is wajib. Because it's a command form, you'll find in the ahadith of the Prophet where he said, Then let him get married in Islam al Amr. Let him get married. And also, likewise, this hadith in which we took last week with the sisters. In the end of the hadith, the Prophet said, وَأَتَزَوَّجُ النِّسَاءَ فَمَنْ رَغِبَ عَنْ سُنَّتِي فَلَيْسَ مِنِّي 
and I marry women, whoever desires or does not desire my sunnah, excuse me, for the one who does not desire my sunnah, then he is not from me. So all these are indications from the Prophet ﷺ in various narrations to point and to show and give us the guidance that that which is the sunnah of all the messengers and prophets in which the Prophet ﷺ highly emphasized that we do and that we should not leave this sunnah off is the aspect of marriage and the aspect of one getting married. And there's another hadith in this hadith which we're going to speak about today which is also on the authority of Anas ibn Malik which is another indication the Prophet ﷺ commanded marriage and that one get married. So all these narrations, you have the narration we took two weeks ago, then the narration we took last week, then you have this narration here today, which is all different various narrations that have been reported and authentically reported upon the Prophet ﷺ, advising that one get married and that it's a sunnah that should not be left off. Rather, it's a sunnah that's been established by all the prophets and messengers, and likewise, in regards to this ummah, as the Prophet ﷺ will mention, we mentioned the narration which says the reason of why he commanded his ummah to get married. So the next, or before we start in this narration, we just want to read it quickly. What the Prophet ﷺ had mentioned and said, or on the authority of Anas ibn Malik, for everyone open their books. And if you look into your book, you'll find a hadith where it says, كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه يأمرنا بالباءة وينها عن التبتلي نهيا شديدا ويقول تزوج الودود والولود تزوج الودود الولود فإني مكاثر بكم الأمم and another narration فإني مكاثر بكم الأنبياء يوم القيامة where the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم had prohibit التبتل or firstly excuse me everyone that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم commanded الباءة as الباءة as we talked about before Alba'a means that one has the ability to get married, financially and also physically. So once one has that ability, then he can carry out the aspect of nikah, of marriage. Notice the Prophet ﷺ mentioned here, alba'a. But if you look into the context in this sentence here, that the Prophet ﷺ used to command alba'a, it means he used to command one and people to get married. He used to command one to get married. And it says he used to command it. Yet muruna. He used to command us to get married. So that's another indication to show that what? That this is where the scholars had drawn the conclusion that marriage and getting one, getting married is wajib. Based upon all these narrations. Even though some of the fuqaha, like we talked about before, said it's accordance to the circumstance of the individual. Of in regards to what we talked about with those details of those who will be wajib upon and so those who's mustahab and those that it could be makru and in some instances it could be haram and in some instances it could be mubah according to the circumstance of the individual and also likewise his ability of marriage because some might have the ba'a or the qudra maliya or he might have the qudra badaniya but he not, might, might not have the qudra maliya he might have the ability of the body meaning to be intimate but he does not have the ability of what they call al-maliyah, the financial ability in which one is able to spend on his wife. And we talked about all of this last lesson. So if one wants to know the details of it, then let him return back to what we mentioned. But notice the Prophet ﷺ here in this instance, it says, if you look in your books, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned the hadith, he used to command us to get married. Ya'muruna bil ba'a. Ya'muruna bil ba'a. They used to command us to get married. Now listen to this next part. And he used to highly prohibit. Listen, it says, Nahyan Shadidan. He used to highly prohibit celibacy. He used to highly prohibit celibacy. And it says in one, and it says in the next part, in the next part, Tazawajul Wadud al Walud. Marry the loving, the women who are loving and then women who are fruitful and can bear children. For verily, I will be mukathir, I will be the one who will have the majority of the most followers from the prophets on the day of resurrection. 
There's another narration that we talked about uh, last week, in which Al Imam Al Albani had authenticated, that gives a little bit more details in regards to celibacy being highly prohibited in our religion. What the Prophet Sallallahu had mentioned in the last part, he says, وَلَا تَكُولُوا كَرَهْبَانِيَةِ النَّصَارَى What the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned in another narration when Imam al-Albani had authenticated, and he said, do not be and do not practice how those monks or the celibacy of the Christians. And I think it's apparent to see of those who practice their celibacy from the Christians, from those monks and those priests, who are especially involved in Catholicism, that you find that they practice abstaining from getting married and they draw close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by this bid'ah, by this innovation, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even mentioned it in his book, وَرَهْبَانِيَ إِبْتَدَعُوهَا مَا كَتَبْنَاهَا عَلَيْهِمْ إِلَّا بْتِغَاءَ رِضْوَانِ اللَّهِ فَمَا رَعَوْهَا حَقَ رِعَيَتِهَا وَآتَيْنَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْهُمْ أَجْرَاهُمْ وَكَثِيرٌ مِنْهُمْ فَاسِقُونَ that Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala have mentioned about celibacy and those monks in those monasteries who used to abstain from getting married and how Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala had highly had prohibited that. That Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, excuse me, excuse me everyone, let me correct myself, in the ayah, excuse me, that Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala said that He did not make that obligatory upon them to practice. He did not make that obligatory upon them to practice. But however, as we said in the last lesson, it was an affair that they invented. It was an affair they had. They came as a bid'ah, as an innovative matter, or something of an innovation, that they came forth and they incorporated it in the religion, and they draw close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala condemned them. And he, and he highly dispraised them for that act, where, where Ibn Kathir mentioned the ayah, as we said, from two aspects. Number one, from the aspect of ibtida'ah. From the aspect of them innovating, bid'ah. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even used the word itself. Bid'ah, he says, ibtada'u'a. They committed a bid'ah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that he, they also, even though they came with this newly invented matter that Allah did not send down, or he did not make it obligatory upon them to practice, they also likewise did not fulfill it. They did not fulfill the aspect that matter. So that's something they tried to draw close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by. They were not able to fulfill that aspect. And you can see this in, this in the aspect of what takes place with a lot of these priests who are involved in getting married and having children behind the closed doors, as they say, that under the curtain or under the tunnel or behind the scenes, you'll find that there were priests who had children. Even though it's in their practice not to get married, but they weren't able to fulfill it. So you'll find out that a lot of them, they will either fall into playing with children and touching children sexually, or even some of them will have children under inconspicuously behind the curtains and hide it. Because it was something that goes against their fitrah, their natural innate disposition that Allah created them upon, which is to have the inclination and desire to get married and to have a spouse and to have family and to have children and the likes of that. So the Prophet Sallallahu here in this hadith, it says, يَأْمُرُنَا بِالْبَاءَ وَيَنْهَا عَنِ التَّبَأْتُلِ بِنَهْيًا شَدِيدًا That the Prophet Sallallahu had prohibited, highly prohibited celibacy in the practice of it. And he said, تَزَوَّجُ الْوَدُودِ وَالْوَلُودِ Marry the loving and also the fruitful, the ones who can bear lots of children. The one who can bear lots of children. They can have a lot of children, multiple children, one after another. Now the question here is, how does a person know this even though he doesn't know the woman he's getting married? Well, if he's doing it in a halal manner, of course. But if he's, how does a person know this? Because a person will ask, tell you about the Prophet ﷺ commanded us to marry the one who's fruitful. But how would I know this? How would I know that she's fruitful? Of course, it's clear for the woman, woman who's probably been divorced, who has two or three children. I think that's clear. That she's fruitful. She can bear children. But what about a woman who's a, who's a bicker, who's a virgin? How would he be able to know that she's fruitful? That's the question we're going to answer in this lesson, inshallah. In order to give clarity in this matter to know how is a woman fruitful or how she can bear lots of children. So if he wants to get married, he will know this more than likely 
he will attain this information before, or he'll be able to know this information before he marries her. I'm going to explain that, inshallah. So, in the aspect of al-wadud, so the Prophet ﷺ prohibited tabattul, or what they call rahbaniya. He prohibited celibacy, and one what, as we said, abstaining from getting married. It says in the last, next part of the narration, tazawajul wadud. Tazawajul wadud. He says, marry the wadud and the walud. Marry the woman who's, who's loving. And in the, there's a, there's a fa'ida in which, which is in regards to this matter. That Allah ta'ala, upon the tongue of his Prophet وسلم, commanded us to marry a woman who's loving. There's a benefit in this matter. Why? Because the Prophet وسلم, said, look for the woman, woman who's loving. The reason why he mentioned this is to show there's an indication for women. There's a fa'ida and a benefit to say how women is easy to please a man to use their femininity to make his heart soft. Not in a in a a matter or a manner which is uh, what they call you being sarcastic and you're not being realistic about it. But if you have a natural love for your husband to show your femininity, for verity, if your husband came in the house and it looked like he had a hard day to try to use your femininity and use your, yourself as being in that soft type of manner in which Allah has created and that demeanor that Allah has instilled upon the woman of being soft and being sympathetic and using her femininity to soften up her husband's heart in which he'll love her because if he had a hard day and, he's in the, and he came upon the house in which his chest might have been tightened due to certain things that took place throughout the day or, or during the day so she's able to say those soft kind words and use her femininity in order to calm him down and, and let him feel relaxed. And to let him feel relaxed. And this fact, the person will ask, so where did you get this from? Notice, in, and I'm going to read this quickly, in which the great Imam Ibn Uthaymin, he mentions in, in regards to this hadith. He says that the meaning of al-walud, or the meaning of al-walud, or the one being, or the woman being loving. He says that if the man was to come in the house and he's his sadruhu da'iq, he says, for, oh, number one, I'm going to go back a little bit. Ibn Uthaymin, he mentions, he says, Al-wadud, yani kathira til mawadda alati tatazawad, tatawaddadu lizzawji. He says, the woman who has a lot of love and shows a lot of sympathy and she's sympathetic and she shows and expresses and manifests that love to her husband. That she's loving towards her husband. He says, Because this Listen to this. That the woman, because they are women, she said they are loving to the husband. And the husband loves her. The husband loves her. That natural love, of course. The natural love, and we know in our aqidah there's nothing wrong with that. To have that natural love towards his or her spouse is something from our religion that is permissible to have that natural love. That not the, nat the love of ibadah. The love of ibadah, that's in aqidah, and that's in things that's in regards to the ibadah. That's only for Allah. The love as far as the ibadah. But this is natural love. As we know, the Prophet ﷺ used to naturally love Aisha more than his, than his other wives. So, that natural love in which Ibn Uthaymin is talking about, is, or that type of love he's speaking about here, is that natural love. He says, That the woman becomes loving to the husband by her soft speech. And her becoming beautified, and beautifying herself, and decorating herself, and adorning herself. He says, and other than that, from those asbab, or those reasons, or that which will cause love between the two spouses. He said, "Women in the same way take on the ex." He says, "And that's likewise here from women who's the opposite. Some women, if the husband was to come upon her or used to enter the house, he did dakhal zawjha, wa sadruhu daik, fa'alat ma yusiru sadruhu hatta yusar, wa yuzula anhu diq sadr." He said, "There are from women, of course. We just gave this example that if the husband is a little tight-chested, meaning that he's not having a good day." You'll find there are women that knows how to open up his chest and make him feel good until he becomes happy, and he says, and it goes away from him, 
having those that type of tight chest or that sadness that he had. And there are some women that if he causes or if he comes in the house, she says she'll start to ridicule him in his face and he'll and he'll increase in the bala and su. And he'll increase in being tested and evil. He says, for in this instance, the meaning of the hadith, wadud, the meaning of the hadith, when the Prophet said wadud, the meaning of it is just the, of the first example that we just gave. That the woman, if the man's to come, and he feels some type of grief or sadness, and yes, he had a hard day. She knows how to take advantage of that soft speech and looking pretty and making him forget about his hard day. Making herself look nice and then using simple her feminine side to soften up his heart. Whether it be rub his shoulders or no, and every woman knows how to please her husband or knows where her husband likes and what he doesn't like. And and this according to every different spouse is different. He says, but however, who's the opposite of the wadud, meaning barut, barut, meaning who the husband dislikes. He doesn't like her. So it's not walud. So the opposite, if a woman is not like that, meaning if he comes in the house, he's not feeling well, he's having a hard day, she'll start to ridicule him or say something of uh, inappropriate words in order to make him feel even more uncomfortable. This is what you call barut. Barut. The, the, the one in which the husband detest. He says, "Athaniya fil haqiqa tujibu an yubghidha zawjuha." For Rasul, amra an tazawj al wadud. He says, "In the second, which we talked about here, when a woman might ridicule him and not make him feel uncomfortable and relax when he enters the house, he says tujibu an yubghidha zawjuha." He says, "This will necessitate, and it will cause, it will necessitate and cause that our husband will dislike her and hate her." And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that he commanded. To marry the wadud, to marry the women who are loving, meaning sympathetic, that are feminine, sympathetic. They know how to please the husband by using their femininity and knowing how to soften up his heart. He says, Well, hikmah min dharik laysa hu al iqtisada ala sa'ada tis zawjiya faqat, bel il hikmah min dharik ala al inzan, ida wadda zawjata, ahabba mulaqataha, wabi mulaqatiha, yakthur al nasal. Listen to the hikmah why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Or the benefit of why the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned wadud before walud, mentioning the loving before bearing the children. He says, listen to this. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam here commanded that the to marry the wadud first. He says, because the hikmah from that or the wisdom behind that is not just to al iqtisar al sa'adat al zawjiyah for hasab, it's not just restricted to happiness. Uh, happiness within the marriage and that's it and that's it rather he said the hikmah from that is that if the husband loves her his wife he will love to meet her like he can't wait to come home to her if he knows that his wife is sympathetic and loving he looks forward to what coming home and entering the house he says فَإِذَا أَحَبَّ زُوْجَتَهَ أَحَبَّ مُلَاقَاتَهَ that if he loves his wife, he will love to meet her. I mean, to see her and come home and look forward to coming home. His house is comfortable. His wife is what is loving and sympathetic, and she's she's he he he's pleased when he comes in the house. And he says, what will come as a result of it when he meets her? He says, the nesal yakthur nesal. He says that the the actual taking place of progeny and ones and, and, and the children will take place, and there will be a lot of it. Because if one loves his wife, he will love to have children and he will love to be intimate with her so they can have a lot of children and the progeny can continue and he'll have a lot of it, an abundance of it. So it's not just restricted to that which is al-sa'adat al of being happy in the marriage and that's it. Rather, if he loves his wife and he loves to meet her, he said then the, then the Prophet ﷺ followed it up, which will be the result of that is that which she will be what? She will bear children and she will have a lot of children by him because of that happiness that took place from her being loving and sympathetic. So that's from the benefits of why the Prophet ﷺ mentioned wadud before walud. Marry the loving. Marry the loving before the actual aspect of what? Bearing children. So that's one of the benefits of it. Now the next benefit that we want to talk about 
and, it, and inshallah, we'll stop here because like, I don't want to make the lesson too long for the people because I know they're busy due to the circumstances of snow and other th other things that people still have to do and work. So we take consideration of the roof and the circumstances of people during these days because like we said, the weather has been extremely uh, has been uh, extremely a little difficult. So we keep it short as much as possible. But at any rate, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had mentioned in the last part, Al-Wadud, al walud So he mentioned Wadud, the loving, Wadud. Then he said, marry the Walud, afterwards. The women who can bear a lot of children. How? And we just said to the question, how does a person know that a woman is Walud? Of course, if a woman was divorced or she had children prior, then that's clear. It's clear she can bear children. But what about the one who's a bikr, the woman who's, she's a virgin? Or she might have been married, but she never had any children. She might have been married prior, might have been divorced, but she never bared any children. How can we still know that she's what? She's walud. She's walud. You'll find that Ahl Ilm, from Ahl Ilm, who mentioned and say that Ask about the family. Usually that's a high indication to show that one is very, more than likely able to what? To bear children. Ask about the family, for example. Ask if one was to get married to ask, or if he's inquiring about marriage, to ask the sister or ask the, your, your, your mother, how many children does she have? Your sisters, how many children does she, do they have? Maybe your aunt. To the end of it. Usually that's a strong karina, a strong indication that a woman is very fruitful. Now as far as the woman who became uh, what they call l'uqum, where she's not able to bear children, where she became sterile, she's not able to bear children due to some type of sickness or due to some type of injury, then that's what they call amrun arud. That's something that happened because of something outside. That has nothing to do with what we're speaking about here. Something outward where an incident happened or a disease or a sickness May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us for due to a sickness or illness or accident. That's not the indication that, or those are not naturally goes back to her fears of her being what's sterile. That's something that happened outside that might have caused it. That has nothing to do with what we're speaking about here. When we're talking about those women who are fruitful, or like we said, to look to usually the mother, to look to usually the aunt, to ask about the mother, to ask about the spouse or the ask about the immediate family, to ask to the, about the sisters, to the end of it. Usually that's a strong indication that she's able to bear lots of children. So the Prophet ﷺ, when he said, Walud, that which pertained to woman being fruitful, and she's able to bear lots of children, and she's able to have lots of children, then one attains that information by, like we said, to ask about the family, to ask about the mother, to ask about the sister, to ask about her qadibat. Her immediate family, her immediate family, and likewise the relatives, and that will be able to, for one, to determine whether or not she is walud. Then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had talked about in the last narration, "For inni mukathirun bikumul anbiya." Verily, I will have the majority of of the followers on the day of resurrection of the prophets, because the prophets will have followers, and some of them will have. A lot of followers, and some of them will not have a lot of followers. Some prophets will have one follower. Some prophets will have two. And there will even be a prophet, and he will not have any followers. So all of this we'll speak about next lesson, inshallah. We'll suffice by this for today. Like we said, we want to keep it short as possible due to the difficulties of the weather in these days. And that one has people have things they have to do. So we'll keep it short, and we'll continue next week. على آله وصحبه وسلم وسبحانك اللهم وبحمدك وشهد لا إله إلا أنت وأستغفرك وأتوب إليك